episode of Surviving the Survivor. We bring you the best guests in all of true crime. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button. Here's your host, Emmy Award-winning broadcaster, Joel Waldman. What's up, SGS Nation, and welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises to bring you the very best guests in all of true crime. And if we bring you the best guests, I don't know what to call this, the best dist, you're not going to find a better panel on the Charlie Adelson trial anywhere if you do, money back, guaranteed. Of course, Charlie Adelson, he is the wealthy South Florida periodontist, guy who was uh, flying around in Ferraris and meeting fast women. Uh, He managed to elude justice for nine plus years in the 2014 killing of Florida State Law Professor Dan Markell. He, of course, was convicted Monday on all counts in his murder trial. Charlie's sentencing is set for December 12th, where he's expected to be sent to state prison for the rest of his natural life. The question must be asked, will other Adelsons soon follow in his inauspicious footsteps. Here to discuss, Dave Arenberg is the Florida State Attorney for Palm Beach County. He's also a former member of the Florida Senate. He was elected to the Senate in 2002 as its youngest member and served for eight years. He is a graduate of Harvard undergrad and Harvard Law and a former classmate of Dan Markell's and a proud Miami Heat fan. Jason Jason Solomon, he is the executive director of the Stanford Center on the Legal Profession and a lecturer in law from 2013 to 2016. He served as associate dean for academic affairs and chief of staff to the dean at Stanford Law. All you have to know about him, he's super smart and he runs and organizes Justice for Dan Markell. Then you guys all know famed Tallahassee defense attorney, are Timothy Jansen. He was doing all the color commentary during the trial. Uh, he's going to be featured, by the way, this Friday night on 2020 as they do a special episode on the Charlie Adelson trial and what uh, transpired with Dan Markell over the nine plus years. So tune into Tim Friday night on 2020. Last but certainly not least, John Singer is co-founder of Singer Deutsch LLP, a graduate of the Georgetown Law Center a New York super lawyer for as many years as there have been in our existence. And he makes regular appearances on shows like this and CNBC quick programming note. Um, please, if you can support us on YouTube or Patreon, if you can't do that, five stars on audio is a huge, huge help for us. Appreciate that. Cannot thank you enough. During the coverage of this trial, we reached 75,000 followers about a million and a half views for the month. And that is all, as I say, best guests, better community. Thanks to all of you. And tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern time, we're going to take a look into Charlie Adelson's new life. No more Ferraris, no more strippers. He's going to state prison. And who do we have? We have a guy named King Tone. He is a former Latin King gang member. He ran the New York City chapter of the Latin King gang. He will join us tomorrow along with former inmates Larry Levine and Tommy Scoville for some amazing insight into what is awaiting Charlie Adelson. So, Tim Jansen, you're in Tallahassee. We got some kind of big bombshell breaking news, as they say, over at CNN, not to name names. And it revolves around a motion filed by the defense. A motion was filed late Tuesday afternoon by Charlie Adelson's defense team requesting the judge, Judge Stephen Everett, to interview the jurors involved in the case. It comes one day, of course, after this this conviction. What is this all about, Tim Jansen? And should we all be concerned or is it a nothing burger? Well, it's never a nothing burger if you have possible jury misconduct. But the question is, does it rise to the level the judge is even going to inquire? Uh, is he going to con? He's going to need more substance in what's been filed. Um, during the trial, you know, we had that one juror that was, we believed was with the defense, right? And he was juror 13. So he was a alternate juror and he had to leave. Um, Rashbaum contacted some ABC people and said he was contacted by 
alternate jurors and two out of the three said they would have acquitted. So I don't know if this same juror that was with Rashbaum is the one instigating and promulgating all this so-called information to uh, his defense lawyer. We'll see. There's going to have to more substance in what is um, what's been filed, I think. And I just want to reiterate what you just said to Jason Solomon and get his take. Tim just said that, according to his source, two of three of the alternates would have acquitted. Uh, does that surprise you, Jason? And what about this one juror? And I'll tell you what we were saying about him the whole time. But first to you, Jason. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's easy for people to say what they what they would have done if they're not if they're not really really in there making the decision and of course the group dynamic is important hearing from from your fellow jurors about what 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 you would actually do um you know i trust that this is not going to reach a level that 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 will be a problem for this uh for for this trial but i also trust that that even if for, by some remote chance it had to be tried again charlie adelson is never going to come up with any kind of explanation that is possibly believable that is going to be able to get him out of jail in his natural lifetime. And I'm very confident of that. Well said. Dave Arenberg, uh, you covered Alec Murdoch. We heard all about the uh, clerk of court after that, Becky Hill, and some, you know, some nonsense associated with her. Are you concerned in this case? Uh, let me just read the quote from this alternate juror who contacted the judge. According to this quote, he says, or she says, one or more members of the jury asked all other jurors for their telephone numbers, after which some sort of group chat was established. Dave. Well, if that is true, it is not a violation. And here's why. Jurors are allowed to talk outside the courtroom. They go to lunch with each other. They're allowed to go on smoke breaks together. They just can't talk about the case. Mm -hmm. As long as they didn't talk about the case in the group chat, it's not a violation. So I'm not worried yet. And even if someone mentions something about the case, that's not automatically cause for a mistrial or a retrial. You would have to show that the discussions had some material impact mm -hmm. on the verdict. It's not super easy to show that. But look, if they were talking about the case back and forth throughout the group chat, that'd be a violation of the court's order. And that could lead to a new trial. But that's a long way off. Right now, we just hear that there's a group chat. That's a nothing burger as of now. Hmm. Uh, John Singer, to you, adding on to this, this alternate juror, after kind of blowing the whistle here, John Singer says that that this juror himself or herself was unaware of what was said on the group chat, mm. uh, but explained that he felt uh, it was something the parties in the court should be aware of. Um, before you answer, all week, I was, I was there all week last week, and there was one juror that we all talked about, and I'm 99% sure this is him. At one point, he ran, and that's why I said him, at one point he raised his hand, asked to speak to the bailiff privately, said that people in the gallery were talking too loud, very strange like mannerisms, very strange affect. And when Daniel Rashbaum was speaking or Charlie was on the stand, he would sit at the edge of his seat. He seemed pro-defense. Um, it was someone who stood out to all of us. And I'm almost certain this is him, but without further ado, ado, John Singer, this guy himself says he's unaware of what was on this group chat, if there was a group chat. Right. I mean, I read the motion that Rashbaum filed today and I saw the exhibit, which is from that alternate juror. There's no um, suggestion there was anything untoward about the group chat. They may and, and probably were setting up a group chat so that when the jury um, is released and when this case is over, they can keep in touch, right? They have this now common ground. They mm -hmm. sat on a high profile case. They may want to have a group chat going forward to discuss whatever it is they want to discuss. But there's no suggestion from Rashbaum or even from this alternate juror that there was any discussion about the case. It was just setting up of a chat. As, as Dave said, nothing at all improper or impermissible of, or impermissible about that. So I'm not one bit concerned. Hmm. Uh, thank you to Nikki. She says she loves her cover, our coverage of this case. Uh, appreciate it. Huge shout out again to Tim, who's been here the whole time, and the COE and Space Coast and all of our awesome mods. And, of course, our community uh, for coming together on this. 
Uh, the quote from the defense here, uh, before I get to that quote, I'll throw that to Jason. Tim Jansen, Dave Arenberg just talked about this. The process now. So what has to be done now that this motion was filed? And, and by the way, where is Daniel Rashbam? Is he still up in Tallahassee at this at this point? Did he file this in Tallahassee and then maybe took back off for South Florida? But what what is the process and what's going on behind the scenes? Well, these days, everything's filed electronically. You don't usually go into the court to file anything unless you're filing it under seal in federal court. Then you got to hand walk it over uh, to make sure the clerk files it under seal. He could file it from anywhere. Uh, I think Daniel left town. Of course, I don't know if he stayed to interview jurors. Maybe he thought somebody would contact him. Um, I agree with the panel. They can talk as much as they want. They talk during breaks. They go to lunch together. As long as they're not talking about the case or bringing outside information into the jury for deliberation, this is going nowhere. The judge will give the state a chance to respond. The state will probably do their own investigation. And I think they'll probably have an in-chambers uh, meeting with the judge to see if it reaches a threshold to even interview the juror. Um, it should be public, though, because everything's public. Um, but I think he's going to – I don't know if there's enough right now and whether they bring that – they're going to bring the alternate in. And all he can say is up a little they bit. signed up for a group chat. He doesn't know if they ever had a chat. So how does that reach – the, the level for the court to do anything. Yeah. Right? It doesn't sound like he was a part of the chat. Yeah. It sounds like right. he was not a part of this chat. Uh, Jason to you, here's a quote from the defense motion. What we do know is that this particular juror was uncomfortable enough to reach out to us, given the extensive publicity surrounding this case and the intense media and community interest in its outcome we believe that an interview of the jurors, either either by this court or by undersigned counsel, is required to ensure the integrity of the jury's verdict in this. What does that? How does that read to you? I don't. The fact that an alternate who appeared pro defense the whole time to people who were watching, then reached out to the defense lawyer afterwards after the defendant was, you know convicted in what three hours or less mm -hmm. that doesn't surprise me um it doesn't surprise me but there's nothing that he's indicated um the fact that he thinks he might have seen it differently than the rest of his peers that doesn't that doesn't strike me as reaching a level where the judge has to get involved in interviewing the jurors i would think there would have to be more uh, the judge uh, is not going to let the defense lawyer interview the jurors that is not going to happen that okay and how you know you mentioned this in person with the judge in his chambers did you say how soon that might happen tim uh, the, he the judge is going to need more information than what he's been given because he's going to tell him listen they can talk they talk at lunch they talk before they get here they can talk all they want as long as they're not talking about the trial and <laughs> and that's i mean he hasn't introduced any evidence that they talk about anything other than how they're doing. Dave Arenberg, you know, you know, Georgia Kaplan's shoes that she's walking in better than anyone. You would be the equivalent of her boss if she was in your office. What do you think is going on in her head here in this? Is she, I mean, she's enough mm -hmm. of a professional. She Does she realize it's just noise at this point? Yeah, after putting her heart and soul in this case and going for so many weeks uh, trial, she's probably thinking, yeah, of course, uh, you know, these jurors, they have a mind of their own. And the only thing predictable about juries is that they're notoriously unpredictable. <coughs> but right now she's probably thinking that, but knowing that it's very unlikely that it's going to mess up this verdict. Uh, as the panel said, look, jurors can talk to each other. It's okay. They can have a group chat. They just can't talk about the case. Um, and, and by the way, I see uh, Angel Knight's comment on the bottom. Uh, Charlie's not getting away with 15 years. He's going to, going away for life. He's got life, yeah. Life in Florida is life, as they say. Uh, Dave Arenberg, uh, Jack Campbell is your counterpart in Leon County. Um, are you able to tell us if you talk to him at all? You send a little email back and forth? You're going to keep that between you and him if you did. Joel, I, I know you directed that question to me. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me okay. I'm having some trouble hearing you. I think um, 
I don't know if it's the internet connection, but I couldn't hear your entire question. You're talking about my my uh, colleague uh, Jack Campbell. Yeah, if you've sp if you've spoken to him at all since the verdict. Oh, I texted him. <laughs> uh, I've I spoke to him a bunch um, before and uh, before the case, and then texted him during the case, and and uh, now I text him afterwards. He was very effusive of Georgia and his team. You know, he didn't want to take the credit himself. But look, Jack had to make some tough decisions here. You remember, this case originally was uh, brought to the previous state attorney, Willie Meggs, who had been there a long time. And Willie refused to charge yeah, sure. the family, even though the police, law enforcement, said they had probable cause to do so. Jack Campbell is the one who charged Charlie. Now, in Willie's defense... Willie did not have a Dolce Vita tape. That's what led to the charges against Charlie. And now I do believe that there are more shoes to fall. And, he, and we lose them. Yeah, right on that. It is, that is a uh, suspense. We're, we're going to talk about all that. And Dave will be back. Uh, his assistant must be out today. That is my guess on uh, what day is today? Today is Tuesday. John Singer, you said you had a little bit of a, uh, theory or some thoughts more you know in depth about why we're discussing this alternate juror you care to share um or expand on it a little bit from your first answer no i mean i think that the this person the way you described him um he was sort of an oddball and i think you were engendering a little bit of fear in sts nation that we may have a holdout so i think that we were all a little bit uh concerned by um the odd nature of this individual. But I, again, it was a very opaque email that he wrote uh, to Rashbaum. And Rashbaum attached it as Exhibit A to the motion um, to the court. And it basically just said that I want to talk to you. Um, and and this, that's all it was. So the judge really, I don't think the judge can call the attorneys in chambers because Rashbaum has already told the court what he knows, which is nothing, that it was just a group chat that was set up. The judge can call one juror himself and just ask the juror what's the co what's the content of that group chat, and we can dispense with this in exactly you know five seconds. Um, so I think of ultimately it's going to go nowhere, um, and I don't think the prosecution is giving it much um, giving it much thought or losing any sleep over it. Jason, you're you're the uh, scholar among these gentlemen working at a university. <clears throat> what kind of issue is the current state of technology, social media, creating um, in the court system. I, I don't need a 300 page thesis, but it just relates to this. You know, I mean, group chats have been around for a long time, but just the fear that a juror could see something on Twitter or on Instagram. What kind of impact is that having, you know, prior to deliberations, deliberations and post convictions? Yeah, and I should clarify, uh, not, not that it matters, I'm not based at the university anymore, but in any event, the, um, the, I think the important thing about things like text and group chats is, you know, it's the same as, as documents, right? It's the same as emails. So it's all kind of fair game in terms of, you know, things that can be looked at. I mean, I think my question is, you know, in this case, and, for, and frankly, the, the more experienced trial lawyers here would have a better sense of, you know, is the judge just going to ask to just look at the group chat? I mean, this is what uh... is a group chat was set up by some of the jurors several days before the verdict was rendered. Nobody knows what the content is. Apparently, this alternate was not um, a, a participant in the group chat, or perhaps they didn't ask him <laughs> his phone number for obvious reasons. Um, but that's all we know. So the judge, th th there's nothing for the judge to go on. If the judge wants to make this as clean as can be, I mean, he can ask, you know, one of the jurors for a copy of the group chat. It, it, the way, Joel, you described these jurors to to all of us is that they were paying rapt attention to what was happening in the proceedings. They were stoic. They were attentive. They were um, conscientious, seemingly. Um, the judge over and over again propounded the same instruction, which is don't talk about it. Don't look at any media coverage on it. So the way you describe describe this jury this jury panel, it seems that they would be adhering to those instructions. So again, I think this is a, a much ado about nothing. The prosecution 
isn't ascribing any weight to it. The prosecution, by the way, did oppose um, the request um, for the for the interview of the jurors. So the, the prosecution did put in in opposition um, that they that they don't want this to go forward. Nor, nor should they. This should just stop here. But you know, well, again, we'll see what the judge does. But I think it ultimately ultimately leads to nothing. But John, and, they also that jury was composed of two former four persons of a jury and a former <laughs> law enforcement. Right. So the four persons would be leaders and they would certainly understand their roles. They would certainly not do anything to violate the rules since they were in that position of power when they were in jurors. And, and John, I can tell you, I was in the courtroom for a full week. I watched those jurors really closely. They took this very seriously. Uh, they were taking notes. They were attentive the whole time. They weren't making faces. They weren't yawning, uh, except for during parts of uh, Rashbaum's clothes. I think then they started to file their nails a little bit. Um, we'll, we'll get to that. But and I got to say it again, and, and people get mad. But Daniel Rashbaum was a gentleman. He was nice. Came up to us. Had a very difficult job there. Um, seeing a super sticker here, and then I want to get to Tim for one more question on this, and we'll move on. Why? Why was Charlie Adelson? Tim, to you, why was Charlie from Kelly D? Why was Charlie Adelson cuffed and the tie missing before the verdict was read? Did they all just know he was guilty? He hadn't been cuffed uh, prior days. Thank you for all the coverage. I'm new to you guys. Welcome, Kelly. Hope you're old to us in three years when you're still with us. But Tim, go ahead. So when a jury is in deliberations, outside the jury door is a for uh, is a uh, is a bailiff. And somehow, some way, especially in federal courts, these bailiffs are able to hear what's going on inside. So messages get sent to the bailiffs. Messages get sent to the prosecutors. They're never sent to the defense, though. <laughs> I had one time where a bailiff came in and he winked at me. And so I knew we had a not guilty. But it's an unwritten rule. If they think he's going to be convicted, they're going to take his tie and they're going to take his belt. And they're going to put handcuffs on him so he can't flee or try to run. Uh, that's safety precautions. I think the bailiffs knew what was coming. I think with the quick verdict, I think everybody knew what was coming. So that's why um, they probably had him on suicide watch that night at the jail. Uh, Margaret here, Tim, I'm going to toss this right back to you since you're in Tallahassee. Does the judge know the verdict before the jury reads it or at the same time as the defendants? The judge does not know the verdict. The judge finds out uh, when the clerk hands him the paper. The judge is not near the bailiffs. All he hears, we have a verdict. He tells the people, call everybody. Once they're there, he comes out. He looks at it to make sure that it's unanimous, look, uh, that it's signed by the four person, whoever that is, and that they filled out all the property. You don't have two spots filled out with a guilty or not. And, and, and he'll look at it. And if it's proper, he'll tell them to read it. But I don't think he knows ahead of time. COE, by the way, get Tim Jansen a microphone and a ring light immediately. That guy's too handsome to be sitting in the dark and that thick head of hair of his. We got to illuminate that. Uh, Jared T Tessis, uh, Dave, I'm going to throw this to you. This was a point that was brought up. And again, we'll move on from this, what you guys claim to be a nothing burger momentarily. But why would the juror, this alternate juror, email one of the lawyers, the defense attorney, versus contacting the judge or the bailiff or the uh, court clerk? It seems biased already that the juror contacted Daniel Rashbaum directly. Do you agree with that? Yeah, well, it, it tells you that this juror was a defense juror. I believe Rushbaum when he said that two out of the three or maybe at least one of the three reached out to him to say that they would have acquitted. I, I think this juror would have acquitted and prosecution really dodged a bullet that he was an alternate juror. Uh, just so your audience knows, the parties, the attorneys know who the alternate jurors are from the beginning. So it's not like at the end, they just had a luck of the draw. They knew who they were talking to and they knew who would be sent out if the juror remained intact. And that guy was always going to be an alternate juror, thankfully for the prosecution. And it's no surprise that he had this pro-defendant Ben and instead of going to the judge or clerk who he could have gone to, he went instead to the defense lawyer. That just tells you all you need to know. Right. Candy Kane here says, I think he was a plan. He was said to be mad when announced as an alternate. He was a one nodding with Charlie and glaring at Georgia. That is true. Jason, I promised the last question to be the last one. But what about this? Um, does it surprise you to hear that two of three alternate jurors 
would have potentially voted to acquit. I know you said it wouldn't make a difference in the long run, but how devastating a blow would, would that have been to the Markell family and, you know, to you behind uh, justice for Dan Markell? You know, it would have been it would have been a blow, certainly. But I think as with Katie Magbanawa, like, you know, you may be able to get a holdout one or two jurors to to vote to acquit. But, you know, we knew when 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 Katie was not convicted that first time that she still wasn't getting out of jail anytime soon. And she would eventually be convicted and the prosecution would would have more of a sense of how she was going to try to defend herself and be, be prepared for that. And I think the same thing would have happened here. I think, you know, um, the, the prosecution would have had the preview of the really cockamamie theory that Charlie presented in its own defense, this kind of double extortion thing. Um, and, you know, would have been as prepared as, as they were next, uh, next time to, to convict them. So I don't think, uh, you know, even if that had happened, you know, Charlie wasn't going anywhere. And Jason, right back to you. This is a photo of Phil Markell, who, by the way, I had a chance to talk to uh, quite a bit. You see Katie Coolady, by the way, and Brandy Churchwell in the background. That's Shelly Markell, his daughter next to him. Mm -hmm. You can just see the, the surge of emotion here. What was it like for you? It's been over nine years, Jason. You knew Dan Markell. Uh, maybe you could tell us a quick story and what this was like emotionally for you to hear the word guilty. Yeah, I mean, it was really just just relief, I think. I think, um, as you say, it's been nine years. It's been a long time coming. You know, as, as David indicated, um, Tallahassee Police Department wanted to charge him, you know, several years ago. And the prior state's attorney admittedly didn't didn't totally have all the evidence that the current state's attorney have. But, but for whatever set of reasons, um, the prior state attorney didn't want to charge him. And so, you know, I think you know, there was just a, a level of uh, anxiety throughout for all all those who were watching this case and for all those who who knew Dan, um, you know, just anxiety that the people who were really responsible for this would get away with it. Um, and just the fact that it was this open thing that, you know, everyone sort of knew all the evidence was out there, that the Adelson family was behind it, and particularly Charlie and his mom, Donna, were behind it. Um and so, you know, it's just great that that they have been held accountable and just so much, you know, relief um, that, you know, the justice system came through in this instance. And John Singer, you're a trial attorney, a very successful one. This is what Georgia Kaplan had to say about the jurors when they went out to deliberate. Let's listen and we'll get your uh, response. Goes out. I'm extremely worried. So I was worried. I mean, it's not that I don't trust these jurors or trust my case or trust the evidence or justice, but you never know what's going to happen. And it was a lot of information that was thrown at them. So I had to just sort of hold my breath until the verdict came back. So you heard her say she was nervous. John, are you always nervous when a jury goes back to deliberate? Always. Um, it doesn't matter the case. It doesn't matter what sort of gesticulations the jury or the arbitration panel is making during the course of the proceeding until you hear the verdict, um, you are always nervous. And that's what makes, you know, a good trial lawyer is somebody who is always anticipating and always believing that the other side is going to put on the best possible case they can. You never want to underestimate your opponent. In this case, I think Dan Rashbaum did a really good job. We can get more into the granularity of that later. But at the end of the day, um, you always have to ascribe brilliance to your opposing counsel and to their theory because you can't ever underestimate. Um, overconfidence is something that would sink any good trial lawyer. So I'm sure she was nervous. Um, we were nervous. Um, I think we all had a, had a feeling as to where this was gonna go after the summations. But you know, until you hear it, um, that then you can exhale, but not before the mellifluous sounds of New York city and the, the dissonant sounds in the background there that I don't miss at all. But John Singer loves, um, Dave Ehrenberg, you're the only other person besides Jason on this panel that knew Dan personally, you've been following the case, obviously for the nine plus years, what was your reaction when you heard that verdict? Did, did you know it was a done deal? I, I, you know, with lunch, they deliberated for about two hours without uh, without lunch. I'm sorry. Um, with lunch, they were in there for three hours. So, Dave, what was your feeling when once you heard that word guilty? Oh, hang on a sec. That's my fault. I've got you muted. My fault. Stand by. 
There you go. Thank go you. Ahead. Well, when the jury came back after three hours, three plus hours, I texted you, Joel. I said, verdict in, he's guilty. And <laughs> I mean, it was obvious. And you know who also knew he was guilty? Charlie, because he was a different Charlie when you saw him walk into the courtroom. Wow. The whole time, this he's this cocky dude who loves fast cars and fast women and the South Florida lifestyle. It was a different dude when he finally got caught up in his lies and called out and realized maybe he's not as smart as he thought he was. So I actually was clapping and yelling. I was alone in front of my computer uh, <laughs> watching it live. And I rarely do that because, you know, as a prosecutor, you're used to verdicts, even though we're always nervous before a jury comes in. But when it was read, it just was such a relief that this guy who I really think would have been dangerous back out on the streets because he would have been emboldened that he was above the law and could do anything he wanted at any time and talk his way out of it. So I was so glad that he was convicted. And now, because of that, the prosecutors can go after other members of the family. If he were acquitted, they would not. This would be right. over. Right. Mm. And that's interesting. And I want to definitely dive into that with you, uh, with all of you in a moment. LML, can Charlie get a deal and roll on Wendy, mom, and dad? Tim Jansen? Uh, he's not getting a deal. He's not going to roll on his mom or his dad and on Wendy. And um, he's a narcissist. He thought he was smarter than everybody. When he testified on the stand, Dave, he was enjoying it. I've never seen a defendant that was <laughs> inviting questions and just rolling with it. Like, I mean, this guy really enjoyed it. And um, you wouldn't know he was fighting for his life up there. Uh, but they're not going to give him a deal. I think Don is the next one that's probably going to be indicted. I think Wendy's, is, they got problems indicting Wendy. And I think Harvey, we all, we barely heard the conversation at the sushi restaurant. But I think Don has got some exposure, major exposure. And Tim, as you know, my beautiful mother has felt that Harvey's been involved from the get-go. So we will see how it winds up for him. And I, I want to get into depth a little bit more, uh, to use John Singer's word, the granularity of that in a moment. Lita Randolph here, Carl Steinberg, Carl Steinbeck covered 125 indicators of Wendy's involvement. We've been doing that on our show 120 plus reasons, which is now closer to 125 of why Wendy could be indicted. Uh, John Singer, before we get into depth on that, you've been part of those shows. Uh, do you agree with Dave Ehrenberg that now there's the possibility to move forward? If there was a not guilty or an acquittal, that would have been dead in the water. hundred percent. And uh, again, with Donna, just keep in mind when uh, I think Tim and I uh, sort of came on board around the same time last year, um, in the spring of 22, right after Charlie's um, uh, indictment and after the Magmanua uh, guilty verdict. And we've said it from the beginning, this was done for Donna primarily. It was secondarily done to benefit Wendy, but for Donna, it was anathema for Donna to drive to Tallahassee for 16, the next 16 years, because the kids were three and two at the time in order to see them. She was never gonna do it. She drove Charlie to do it. She had a willing participant in Charlie and a person who had unsavory connections. Regardless of what we think about Wendy, um, I think at some point she knew about it. We can debate if she took any overt acts as part of the conspiracy. But the genesis for this, the entire impetus was Donna. And it was done by Charlie for Donna, not for Wendy. They have and they've had since 2016, all the evidence they've needed to get Donna. They've got her admissions um, right after the bump. They've got her signing the paychecks from the Adelson Institute. They have, um, uh, they have her unhinged emails. Those emails, and th I know the divorce attorney for Wendy tried to portray this as somewhat of a, a normal divorce or these emails were within the realm or the bandwidth of normalcy. No, they were not. She was talking about dressing up her Jewish grandchildren in Nazi garb, okay? These emails, plus her statements on the bump, after the bump, plus her signing of the paychecks, they all lead to guilt for her. And, and again, she's 73 now. She's walked free long enough. It's been nine years since she's been free to spend time with those grandchildren while the Markels 
have been denied access. It's time to go after her and not let her live her golden years in, on South Beach, doting on her grandchildren. Dave Ehrenberg, I was going to go to Tim, but let me come right back to you because this question has come up a lot, Dave. Uh, you would know this better than anyone. Would there be surveillance on Donna Adelson? Is she on some sort of no-fly list? Because if I'm her, I'm on a rowboat to Cuba right now. <laughs> yeah, they probably have eyes on her. They're not going to let her just leave the country. She's got means, and she's now she knows that she's in the sights of prosecutors. It's it may come any day now uh, where they seek an indictment against her. So they're going to keep eyes on her. They'll know if she flees. But I don't think she will. She's 73. She's going to just leave her family and, and run off somewhere else to another country. Uh, I, you know, she is, though, I can tell you, she's got to be stressed out to no end. Like it, it's almost, you know, she, I, she deserves justice if she was involved in, look, the evidence points to her. But my goodness, right now, she's probably freaked out every moment of her life. And it's a, it's a living hell for her right now. Uh, because the uh, the trial was not just about Charlie. It was about Donna. I was actually surprised how much of a spotlight they shined on her and her level of involvement more than any other family member. You guys are right. Uh, she's the one who would go down next. If right. I can mention, there was one question on the screen. If I could quick, quickly sure. answer it, Joel. Go for it. Hey, this is a podcast. Where, you can go as long as you want. This is, no, this I just got to answer this, this question. To ask you're well, I ask if the jurors know if they're the alternates. No, they do not, because if they did, they would fall asleep. Like, yeah, I'm an alternate. Put out my book. Let's look at my phone. And they're told at the end. So they invest weeks of their life. And then they're told, okay, everyone go into the jury room except for you two. And we've seen jurors cry as a result. Like, wait, please, please let me in. And the judge said, sorry, but we've got this certificate for you for for your service. And, and uh, yeah, so well, I think well, that yeah. juror who was rejected was very angry at the end. Oh, yes. yeah. uh, Dave, back to you on this. Just take us behind the scenes, a hypothetical here. This is a hypothetical. Let's say they are looking to move in on Donna, that they're drafting some sort of indictment charge right now. And you said they have eyes on her. If they were to arrest her, how does that go down? Who goes and grabs her? When do they do it? What time of day? Is it early morning? A knock on the door? Is it Miami Beach police? Is it police from Tallahassee? How does it all work? So Georgia Kappelman will go before the grand jury and she will ask a grand jury for an indictment. Now in Florida, you do not need a grand jury to indict except for capital crimes. A capital crime is a crime that is eligible for the death penalty, even though they won't ask for it here. First degree murder, capital crime. So they have to go before a grand jury. So that's an extra step that you have to do in this case. Then, she, and by the way, Georgia's words after the verdict were read, you remember when she was asked yep. if Donna or anyone else is next, she said, stay tuned. Stay tuned. That's not something you say if the answer is no. <laughs> right. So there, you get the indictment and then uh, the uh, the authorities will go out, the law enforcement will go pick her up and it will be, what will happen is it'll be local police. There will be uh, some Miami police will go do it. There'll be some representatives of Tallahassee PD down with them prosecutors won't go down. It'll be law enforcement. They'll pick her up and then they'll bring her up to, to stand trial. It's literally making my palms sweat. I cannot, four of the five of us have Jewish mothers. Uh, I don't think any of them would fare well. Uh, John Singer, how would your mom, John Singer, how would your mother handle being um, handcuffed right now? She, I mean, she would be horrific. I could tell you that. <laughs> Wellington right now, Wellington Bay, they would, Take her out of there. I don't even know what she would do. But, um, you know, on Donna, just one more thing to amplify what, what Dave said, which is interesting, is, you know, Charlie, like it or not, was a formidable witness, right? As Tim said, he enjoyed it. He's a sociopath. He's a pathological liar. He's not a witness that any of us, I think, as trial lawyers relish in questioning. He doesn't give an inch. He's bright. He knew his story. And they still got him by unanimous verdict. Donna's gonna be a disaster. She and the theory is already out there. The theory is out there, okay? I mean, assuming she's gonna go with the same extortion theory, the prosecution's gonna be in a much better position next time. They're gonna have a much easier witness to examine. I don't think she'd ever take the stand. We, Tim and I said from the get-go, 
that Charlie was definitely taking the stand. There was not even one doubt in my mind, one, one scintilla of doubt that he was going to get up there and take the stand. I doubt Donna does. The prosecution knows the theory. We already touched on the evidence. They have her dead to rights. Stop waiting. It's been too long that she's had a chance to enjoy her grandchildren and the Markells concurrently have not. By the way, uh, John Singer making that plea there. But one of the most disturbing things to me, John Singer, was on these wiretaps, how you would hear Donna kind of furtively speaking to Charlie and then pivot to, hey, kids, get on the elevator. She was like, uh, she was grandmothering and plotting a murder simultaneously. Uh, I'm not, you know, an overly emotional person, um, but I have gotten to know Ruth Markell pretty well. And every time that Donna would pivot from conspiring with Charlie to speaking in, in, ba in a baby voice to the grandchildren who were on the swings or, you know, were going to go brush their teeth. I just thought of the Markells. They've been denied. They have been denied that those rights. They've been denied access by a cruel and evil um, former uh, daughter-in-law and Donna. To hear Donna get to enjoy those tender moments when the kids are really at their best ages. Um, I mean, my kids are 9 and 11. I can already see the pivot in my 11-year-old. She's not exactly looking to hang out with me as, as she once was. <laughs> at that age, they're completely obsequious and subservient to you. You're their hero and idol. And I kept thinking of the Markells during those wiretaps. It was really heart wrenching to think about. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm with you. By the way, on all those fronts, my oldest is starting to starting to diss me, John Singer. I don't like it. Uh, since you brought up the Markells, let's uh, listen to some sound from them, and then we'll get back to Jason on his thoughts after hearing this. Joy, happiness. Um, <clears throat> Joy and happiness is a funny thing to say, well, but it's, it's yeah. sort of tinged with this feeling of relief. The relief. It's, it's, it's relief. relief. It's a long time. It's so long, nine years, and uh, <clears throat> we got to this point, and it's just a good feeling. We're thankful. We're thankful to everybody. Grateful. Everybody. Yeah. Thank you. So that was obviously Phil Markell, daughter Shelly on the right, and Ruth, who we've all come to know. And I got to tell you, Phil and Shelly are such stand-up people, along with Ruth. Uh, the, the fact that they've been dealing with this and might have to endure more, um, it is not pleasant. Jason, I know you're in touch with the family. Um, have you gotten any, any indication of how they are doing, how they're feeling? I've exchanged some emails with Ruth uh, very briefly and got a really nice text message from Phil, who thanked us all genuinely. But uh, what have you heard, Jason? Oh, let me let me unmute you. Hang on a sec. I think you're going to have to do it on your end, Jason. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I haven't talked to them since the verdict, but I just get the sense that they're just super grateful. I think, you know, I don't know how often victims' families are really sort of involved over the lifespan of the prosecution of a case. I'd be interested in uh, from others, from Dave and others, and in, in how that tends to go. But I know that they, particularly Ruth, have played an important role in just keeping in touch with the prosecutors, helping them to understand what it means to their family, um, helping them to understand, you know, that you know Jack Campbell, Georgia, Georgia Kappelman. You know, they're busy. They got lots of cases coming in. And just, I think, for them knowing that there was this family that's really looking to them to get justice and some vindication um, in this horrible tragedy, I, th I think has been very important. And I think besides the the pain and the grief that they've had to, to process and deal with over these years in terms of both losing their son and losing access to their grandkids, you know, they've also helped kind of remain strong with the help of some pro bono lawyers in New York in really supporting the prosecution and making sure that a spotlight remained on this case. And so I'm really I'm really kind of kind of both happy for them and, and proud of them for what they've been able to do here. And Jason, how do you think they'll do if, in fact, Donna and or Wendy are indicted? Uh, they'd obviously have to sit through another trial. They're strong people. Uh, how do you think they feel about this? Yeah, I mean, not speaking for them, but just, you know, to build on 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 what what John certainly was saying earlier, the evidence has been out there from from the jump against Donna. It's all the same evidence, more or less, that was against Charlie. So it's just very clear to, to everybody who's been remotely paying attention 
that Donna has a huge level of culpability. And I think, you know, John's right that Donna really was the one driving this train. And so um, I think it's very logical and I have, you know, every expectation that George, Georgia Kappelman in the coming days and weeks are going to indict Donna. And the irony is just so thick because now Charlie Adelson remains in Leon County Jail till his sentencing, which is precisely where Donna did not want her grandchildren to be. So uh, be careful what you wish for. Jennifer Jansen, Super Sticker, 1999. Tim Jansen, uh, you're the local defense attorney in Tallahassee. You know the ins and outs. Is Charlie also allowed impact statements? Um, if so, will any show up? Um, I guess friends or family of his, and is he allowed to speak? I think the answer is probably yes. It's going to happen on 12-12, December 12th. And I know the Markells who go back and forth between Canada and the States, they already informed the court they'll be doing it via Zoom. But what about the defense side, Tim? It's really, it's really moot. The first count one, he's got a mandatory life sentence. They ordered a pre-sentence report because he has no prior record. Uh, that really doesn't matter. That's going to be on top of the life sentence. The judge has no option but to give him life sentence. So I don't know if he needs an impact statement. Uh, the, the victim, certainly the judge is not going to sentence him without hearing their victim impact statements. Uh, that's more to give them their say to the court and address the court. The judge already knows what he's going to give him. He's going to give him their life and give him max on the other counts. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I don't think he needs an impact statement. I don't. Would he be that foolish to get up there and start saying, pushing the double, the double extortion theory again, Judge? You got this <laughs> wrong. I mean, it can't hurt because the judge is going to give him the max anyway. But that would be the third hail mary. First would be the double extortion. Second hail mary is his jury thing, and that would be the third hail mary in this case. Well, the third one I think would just be an embarrassment uh, more so than what it's already been for him. But Tim. This pre-sentence investigation that Judge Everett ordered, uh, that's obviously SOP, but what does that mean to lay people? Uh, probation will go back and do a history of him, where he was born, his health, medical, prior criminal history, education. It's not as encompassing as on a federal pre-sentence report. They're pretty thorough. And the judges you really do use those because they have to do a guideline application. And the state court and, and the probation makes a recommendation that Sometimes in the, but it's not that it's more important for a first time offender that the judge has discretion whether to sentence someone to prison or in that report are there factors that could get a downward departure. That's what the defense is looking for. Um, it's not going to be a downward departure for this guy. Shout out to Black <laughs> Widow, has been uh, through thick and thin with us, coming to us from the Republic of Ireland as well as. Analytical Blarney AB, both friends of the show. She says she's been here longer than three months, and I believe it. Chip Kurth says Donna is going down. Dave, one interesting question that's been brought up, and uh, we still haven't gotten to the granularity, believe it or not. We'll get to as much of that as we can, and I, Dave's going to have to roll out at the top of the hour, close to it. But some people have raised the question, okay, Donna is heard on these tapes. She's obviously a, a sinister human being, up to no good, and she's around these children. Any potential custodial issues now with Benjamin and Lincoln, who are now in the middle of this absolute mess, is there a possibility that the state could step in and do anything? Uh, Wendy obviously is an unindicted co-conspirator. She's not been indicted. I assume if she is indicted, that changes everything. But what about right now? No, I, I don't think the state's going to step in until there's an indictment. Then they would. But if someone's not charged with a crime, uh, they're not going to take children away. Uh, I would hope, though, that this conviction will somehow lead to the grandparents, the Mar the uh, Markells, to be able to see the kids more. There's a law that we pass in Florida to force the Adelson family to give access to the kids to the Markells. But those poor kids have been told, apparently, that the Markells are bad people and they're trying to take their family away from them. And so the kids, I've been told, are not... Uh, really open to the to the Markels. They're they're uh, they have a bias against them, and you can understand that they've only seen them a few times. So um, I'm hoping that uh, this that the Markels will get to see the grandkids more since the laws passed and since Charlie has been convicted. Um, but you know, there's nothing I guess uh, except for the goodwill of Wendy and 
and Donna right now to increase the number of visits unless the state somehow steps in. Uh, news crashers saying, Joey, you try to get an exclusive with Charlie Adelson. Hey, I'm a news guy. If they want to talk to me, I'll talk to them and I'll ask them about that ridiculous theory and I'll press them on being a murderer. Um, I will go toe to toe with Charlie, but I have a feeling that guy's not going to be talking to me. Uh, hey, I would make a go ahead, Tim. I, I, before Dave left, I wanted Dave to talk about Castigar, the issues with Castigar, how subpoenaing uh, Wendy to the stand three times and you can't make derivative use. How problematic is that for the state in filing charges against her? Real quick, Tim, because your lawyer speaking to a state attorney and no one knows what the hell you're talking about. But basically, Wendy, <laughs> Wendy was given what they call derivative immunity on the stand, but it doesn't hold up completely if she was lying. I'm a dummy. So that's how I understand it. Dave, take it from there. I, uh, was she given derivative immunity and not use immunity? She Is was given correct? use immunity and they couldn't make derivative use of anything she said. You yeah, said right. use immunity. You can't yeah. use anything you said, but you can develop independent sources. Derivative immunity is broader. Transactional immunity means you're done. You can't yeah. touch her or anything. Yeah. Um, if so, I, the the uh, connection went out. But if you said she was given derivative immunity or use immunity, I, I'm sorry, she I couldn't was hear given you. use immunity. Right. Okay. Well, that won't affect uh, their future cases. Use immunity. They're going to develop their own evidence. They just can't use uh, what she says. Here's the most telling part. They apparently offered that kind of immunity to force Donna and Harvey to testify. But in the end, the prosecutor said, you know what? We're good. We're good. And I think, no, is that not right, Tim? I thought the reason no, why. You're exactly right. What happened was when, when Rashbaum put him on the witness list, Georgia goes, okay, I want to interview him. And then when he said, I'm not going to call him, Georgia, even though the judge forced him and it was going to happen, Georgia didn't go down because she don't want to deal with that issue. Because I think they're getting ready to be charged. And that's and that's my point. And Joel, one last point of it to go to what Tim was saying. It's a bad sign for both Donna and Harvey that Georgia said, you know, forget it. We're not going to even get into the use immunity issues with you, which means they are more likely to charge those two than Wendy. Wow. You heard Dave Arenberg say that right here, right now on STS. More likely as I'm getting a spam phone call from a guy named Adam. Um Emily winds up, uh, Dave, this is your world. Who makes the call to go after Donna? Does the buck stop with Jack Campbell, your cohort in Leon County? Jack Campbell makes a final decision. Uh, now, Georgia will go to him and the other prosecutors on the case and will say, here's what we got. But it's Jack's name on the dotted line. But he will oh, listen to Georgia. again. Dave oh, no. Yes. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Good. Go ahead, Dave. Go it, ahead. It's Jack Campbell's decision, but he will weigh uh, Georgia Kaplan's opinions very seriously more than anyone because Georgia is the lead prosecutor in the case. Georgia knows more about the case than anyone. If Georgia goes to Jack and says, we need to go after Donna next, Jack's not going to say no way because he knows Georgia is the smartest person in the room on this case. So he's going to defer to Georgia. Right. Yeah. Um. Amy Bo here says Donna's future home is Tallahassee. Uh, the irony would just get thicker if that's the case. Tim Jansen, your world here. These uh, three charges that he was convicted on, concurrent or consecutive sentences? I think they'll give him consecutive sentences. And, uh, and, and Dave, what I like was when they did the press conferences, Jack stood behind the prosecutors and he let them get their way and let them get their media. And you and I both know We've known prosecutors that <laughs> took that limelight away from the line prosecutors for their own political reasons. And I thought that was a great thing by Jack. There you go. Uh, Michael Walker, Jason, I'm going to put you in the hot seat here. Do you think Wendy is guilty uh, and do you think she should be indicted here? <laughs> so I have to. There you go. Um, I think Wendy knew what was going to happen beforehand. Uh, I don't know how far in advance um, she knew. Um, I don't know if they have enough de evidence to indict her. Um, that's, that's, that's what I don't know. I think one thing that I'm wondering about, this came up earlier, is 
like, what's Charlie going to do now? Like, is he really just going to kind of like hang out in jail? He's not really one to, I mean, he obviously doesn't have too many options, but I don't think he's flipping on his mom. I don't think, I don't think he's flipping on his mom. No, I'm not convinced that he's just going to sit there and spend the rest of his life in jail without implicating either his sister who's out there living a good life with her kids or his dad, who I think he, who I think he has a bit of a troubled relationship with. So I, I'm not convinced he's gonna not going to do something. Of course, I don't know that he's going to get anything for it, but I'm very interested in whether he's really going to sit there. Keep in mind, you know, Wendy pointed the finger at him in the days before the murder. She told people, she told a boyfriend that she was in the process of breaking up with that he had looked into hiring a hitman. She mentioned it to a few people. She mentioned it to the TV repair person. So um, I- I'm just a little skeptical that Charlie's going to sit there um, and-, and just kind of take it. And I think his MO, if you look at some of the the police reports when they were investigating, his MO is to like have dirt on people when he needs it. And so whatever records he has of conversations that he had with Wendy leading up to this, I'm not convinced he's not going to figure out a way to do something. with it. This is fascinating. Best guests. It's not just a tagline. It's a reality. You're listening to Jason Solomon, who is the uh, man behind justice for Dan Markell, who knew him personally. John Singer, do you want to pick up on that? There's a super sticker here from Gerard Gerard. Do you think Charlie will make a deal to testify against Donna? You know, he spoke very openly on the stand about how he just doesn't like his brother. Rob Adelson is estranged from the family and he sounds bitter toward Wendy on those wiretaps talking about how lucky she is. He repeated how lucky she is. This is after the murder. She doesn't realize how lucky she is. What about what Jason was just saying? Do you think that Charlie flips on Wendy, if not Donna? I mean, <clears throat> my opinion um, as to what happened was that in, in the two weeks prior to the murder, um, when Wendy was down in South Beach for her father's 70, 70th birthday, which was on July 6th of 14, that's when this whole plan really crystallized. And that's when they got there. That's when they really sat down with Wendy, the, the they meaning Donna and Charlie, and explained to her what to do the morning of the 18th and what to do during the interrogation and even what to do in the days prior, which would include her conversation with Jeff Lacasse that, um, that uh, uh, Jason alluded to. And I think what Wendy was doing with her admission to the, to Jeff Lacasse and with what she said during her, her interrogation, it was all about plausible deniability. A guilty person would never offer these things up. If Charlie were really guilty or if I were really part of a conspiracy, that would be completely illogical for me to do that. So I don't think she offered up Charlie in some sort of mean spirited or slippage way. I think it was all part of the of the mosaic they were building and she was adhering to a script. Now, he'll never flip on Donna. Whether he flips on Wendy, I, I don't put that as completely out of the realm, but even if he were to, would that be enough to secure a deal? They really wanted him. I mean, I think if, if you look at the white whale of this group, it, it had to be Charlie. I mean, I think that it really had to be Charlie. They certainly want the others. And I think that Georgia, after examining Wendy on three different occasions and three trials, <laughs> probably despises her because she's such a pathological liar and she's she's a pretty arrogant person and she's made some statements that no normal person would ever make. Like who on the witness stand would ever say that I'm not worried about being charged. You're not going to charge me. Who would ever say that other than a very sick person? <laughs> so I think that Georgia hates her guts, but I think Charlie was the white whale. And even if he tried to cut a deal, would that secure any sort of a break for him? I don't know. That's uh, a question Dave, for Dave. Dave, would you cut a deal for Charlie right now if he gave up Wendy? Yes, I would do what I'm going to what Georgia is probably going to do with Katie, offer her, you know, 35 years uh, or give her 35 years now. Uh, say, all right, you'll get out before you die uh, and see your grandkids. And I would think she would I don't know if she'll offer what she'll do is she'll wait to see if the defense comes to her. Apparently, Katie came to them. And right. so you right, because you don't want you don't want this guy 
to get any like sense like, oh, you need me. No, we don't need you, dude. You know, we don't like you. We don't need you. But if you want to come talking to us, we will. We want your testimony. And then maybe we'll do something for you afterwards. You remember, Katie did not get a deal to testify against Charlie, mm -hmm. but she's hoping to get one. And as good faith, I think Georgia will give her something. I think that Charlie will watch that to see what Katie gets. And he may go to Georgia and says, I want the same deal. I'll testify against the woman who pointed the finger at me in the interview. I've got the dirt on her. So maybe that's what happens. They, they, they can't uh, give Kit Magbanawa a deal yet. They may need her to testify in another trial, right? You won't give her a deal because I don't think you can get more impeachment against her, but that would be if you cut her a deal and then they charge Donna. Don't you think they'll just wait and give her a one-time deal after she testifies against maybe Donna or Harvey? Um, I only heard bits and parts because of my bad connection, but you're oh. saying that will Katie have to testify in other trials against Donna and Harvey? Right. Yes. Yes. So they the want deal the deal would be you keep testifying yeah. against everyone. Right. And absolutely. Same thing for Charlie. Charlie is not going to flip on Donna. Um, I, I think there is a there is a chance he flips on Wendy. And will he flip on Harvey? Possibly. But definitely not. Definitely not Donna. I mean, I know, look, uh, Joel. You would never flip on Carm. Uh, you know, we, we uh, Jewish moms, you don't flip on them, you know, no, but no. siblings, maybe. <laughs> um, can I can say, pick up on what Dave said. Um, 100%, John. And also what Tim said about Katie. And, and again, Tim and I are, are, I think, in sync on this one as well. We've, we've chatted about this a lot. The prosecution had no desire to call Katie, right? Their hand was forced because of the cockamamie theory that Rashbaum offered up in his opening so they had to bring her up there and testify. If you think they, they wanted her on and off so quickly, and, and if, if there was any doubt about that, go back and watch the proffers. You, you, you know that the proffers were sealed because she was a witness. The minute she was released by Georgia as a witness, the proffers became unsealed, and they are now uh, for your viewing pleasure, okay? I've watched them. They are horrific. <laughs> he, he can't remember anything. George, I thought that she was terrible on the witness stand. I actually think she was an A plus if you compare it to how she was in the proffers. And, and Rashbaum kept saying to her, isn't it true that Pat Sanford was frustrated? Isn't it true that, that Jason Newland was getting agitated? They were because she couldn't remember a thing. She couldn't remember a thing. She was telling them, I'm, I'm begging you to put a chip in my brain to try to extract whatever you can get from it. All she could offer was the, th was the story about Halloween and the sealed envelope. And, and I guess that, that was powerful testimony. I don't think it was needed, but she was a train wreck in those proffers. She, I, I thought she was gonna be, at least have some details. She was so circumspect and so nebulous with everything. Um, they don't wanna call her again if they, if they can avoid it. <laughs> and Dave, Dave, before you have to jump, I always get nervous. I'm now three minutes over with the uh, Florida State. I know. Uh, real, real quickly, Dave, just what do you think of that double extortion defense when Rashbaum laid it out? What was your reaction? Well, uh, before I go, Joe, I've really enjoyed this panel. And because of my back connection, I'm going to have to watch it um, online to see what you got. You, I, you have the best guess. You really do. <laughs> so as far as uh, this extortion plot, here's the deal. Miami and Tallahassee are seven and a half hours away, 400 miles. The people in Tallahassee know that there is no way that these killers are going to go to Tallahassee twice, leave a digital trail, a trail of photographs from the sun pass cameras, risk everything to kill someone that their target hates. How does that move? the ball forward in an extortion plot. It doesn't. That's not how extortion works. You know what, what extortion is? You go to Charlie, you say, you better give me money or else we're going to kill you and your family. That's how extortion works. So, and then I'll leave you with this. Uh, this is a big week in Tallahassee. This is the week that Florida State plays my, my Miami Hurricanes. Mm -hmm. People in Tallahassee hate people in Miami, especially <laughs> this week. Mm -hmm. And so you had... Charlie from South Florida and his lawyer from South Florida going up against against uh, Georgia. And did you see what Georgia was wearing 
during her closing. Did you see the color she was wearing? It was a that rose was FSU. color. That was FSU, FSU garnet. FSU. Yeah. That was FSU garnet. She was playing to a local jury, reminding them, hey, I'm one of you. Mm -hmm. This defendant killed, helped kill one of our local residents because he didn't want the kids to be raised in Tallahassee. How does that make you feel? This trial was going to be a guilty verdict from the <clears> beginning, but Georgia just cinched it. So, Dave, you're awesome. Thank you so much. We'll talk soon. Pleasure to have you. See you, Dave. Thank you, Dave. Thanks, guys. That's interesting. I never made that connection until just oh, yeah. now that she was wearing the FSU colors. Uh, look at this. Bonnie Lopez claims to not have a crush on John, on, uh, John Singer. I hate to do this on uh, global YouTube, but she writes, John Singer, brilliant, handsome, and so correct. I hope your wife can hear that in the distance. Jason Solomon, two thumbs up. <laughs> Tim, looking at the totality of this case compared with Denise Williams, and please quickly remind us. Uh, I'm sorry, Jason, are you... Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I need to run as well. Okay. Great being with y'all. Jason, thanks so much. I appreciate Jason. it so much. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. That's Jason thanks, Solomon with uh, Justice for Dan Markell. Uh, and Georgia wore the hell out of that GSU uh, Garnett. Yes, she did. Uh, the Denise Williams case versus Wendy, they were asking about the level of evidence, I think, if you want to just speak to that quickly, uh, Tim Jansen. Well, the most evidence they had was uh, Brian Winchester, my client, was the main evidence they had against her. They had some evidence about uh, money she was going to receive, like three or four million dollars in life insurance that was about to go away. It was a term policy. Um, and it was basically his testimony against hers. So, yeah, they, they probably do have more evidence against Wendy than they did against Denise. So I don't disagree with that. Mm. Moonchild, we love our DA in Palm Beach County, uh, the Florida State Attorney Dave Arenberg and uh, Ned Smith. Look at this. Who knew Ned Smith's saying that Garnett is my birthstone? Um, so there you go. You learn something new every day. John Singer, this family is literally beginning to cannibalize themselves one by one. It's uh, strange to watch. I got to say, when that verdict came down, I was so happy for the Markells, but you heard Shelly say it's not really happiness. It's a destruction of two different families. And one of the things we don't remember, Charlie Adelson has a son, a five-year-old son. All these lives are destroyed, aren't they? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's so sad. There's so many kids involved. Um, if you include the two kids from Sigfredo and, and Magmanua, you include Charlie's one. You include... Um, you know, Dan and Wendy's kids. And it's, it's just, it's incredibly sad. It's, it's a really sad story. Um, the, the one thing, you know, when you talked about the guilty verdict, um, I was extremely happy, but I have to tell you, I was happier, believe it or not, when the announcement of Charlie's indictment came down because the guilty verdict seemed like a fair complete, right? Throughout the trial, it seemed obvious. There were some bumps in the road. Um, the prosecution didn't have a good Thursday and Friday, um, Charlie did a pretty good job and, and there was no knockout punch and it, it became a possibility that one juror could hang. And, and that that was a bit scary. But after the summation from Georgia and, and after rash bounds, it was very clear that it was going to be guilty. So that that to me was more of a fair complete. When Charlie was arrested, that was six years after the probable cause affidavit was public. That was eight, seven and a half years after the killing, it, it just seemed as if the Adelsons were going to skate. And when he was arrested, that was such a good feeling that that to me was a more joyful feeling than when the guilty verdict came down. Interesting. Eric Bonomo for you, Tim Jansen, any shot Sigfredo and Charlie cross paths in the Florida DOC. Sigfredo, of course, a convicted trigger man, by the way, we've got the, the head of the New York city chapter, former head of the New York City chapter of the Latin King gang tomorrow. And uh, that'll be at 5 p.m. Eastern time to talk about what Charlie might be facing as he goes off to state prison. Um, so to you, Tim, any shot they cross paths or will there be some type of keep away between them? They, they have separatees. As a co-defendant, he'll be a separatee. Sigfredo has already been through the reception center. So he's housed at a final location. Um, Charlie's going to go to a reception center first, 
and then he'll be sent to a location. Um, they probably will not send him to the same place with Sigbredo or, Lu or Luis is in federal custody. So I don't think that's an issue. He's not going to like where he's going to go. He's going to be targeted by multiple groups. Uh, I would think he's probably almost the most targeted person in prison. Um, because the Aryan nation will go after him. The Latin Kings are going to go after him. Um, he can, if he has money, he can buy, he can buy his, his safety. He, he'll find the biggest, baddest guy and he'll be giving his family money on the outside. And that's been done. That is actually done. And I think their money is dwindling, paying for all these cases. Just hearing you say that Tim Jansen is giving me sweaty palms. I don't know what I would do. Um, Gerard Gerard here. I didn't know this, Tim Jansen. George's dad is a legendary FSU quarterback. I did not know. He is. That. He's a well-renowned uh, FSU quarterback. Absolutely. She's a tall woman. She's got, she's got such an um, imposing stature in there. John Singer, a couple more quick things. So Daniel Rashbaum, the defense attorney for Charlie Adelson, he declined comment, taking all his many boxes down the elevator, avoiding the media. Does that surprise you? No. Um, and, and, you know, I feel for Dan as, you know, as a from one lawyer to another, and, you know, we communicate, um, you know, he and my wife went to high school together. So um, I, I do communicate with Dan and he did a great job um, with what he had. I mean, he, the facts were not on his side. And I thought, again, I wasn't in the courtroom, so I can't gauge how his sort of New York persona, um, you know, gelled or didn't gel with uh, the types of jurors that were on this panel, but he was prepared. He did all the work himself. He did the opening, the closing, all the examinations, um, except for the, the, um, the attorney for Wendy, which he gave to Myers, but um, he was very prepared. He had a very difficult client. Um, yeah. You can imagine how Charlie was and um, to rep representing him was no bargain, I'm sure. Um, so I feel for him. Um, I'm glad he lost. I feel for him. Um, his theory, I, I wouldn't have gone with that theory. Um, I would have gone with a different theory. And my only knock on him, and again, it's, it's easy to say, that it's easy to do this um, sitting from afar because you're not in the trenches. But I thought his summation was not his finest hour. Um, I thought his examinations were outstanding. You know, his summation, uh, lots of people, what they do in summations, what I do, is I do it in chronological fashion, and then I weave in witness testimony in exhibits and documentary evidence into the chronology. He didn't do it that way. He did it thematically. And it, it seemed to be sort of all over the place. And then at the very end, he did witness by witness. And, and I just didn't think, and he's certainly very articulate and he got his points across. I just didn't like the way he organized it. So my only criticism of Dan, you know, was, was that. Um, other than that, I think he did a great job. And, and I feel badly for him because it sucks to lose. And it sucks to lose on a big stage like this when there's so much media attention. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he'll probably tout to those who ask or, or down the road that there were people who were willing to acquit. Um, unfortunately, the luck of the draws, they were alternates. <laughs> um, but the theory, you know, I think Charlie came up with the theory. Charlie's had a long time to work on it. I'm sure Dan, Dan didn't ask him a lot of questions because if he did, he couldn't have, as we talked about, suborn perjury or suborn false information. Personally, I think a more effective theory would have been that, yep, I paid these guys, but I paid them to rough them up, right. not to kill them. And they went rogue. One's a lad king. One's a violent man. They were high on drugs. They decided instead of roughing them up to kill them. Now, would that have exonerated him? I don't know. Would that have avoided a first degree murder charge? Maybe. That's a lot better than what he went with because what he went with was just so implausible. Yeah, I agree with you. That would have been a much stronger defense. Uh, with that said, I thought he did a great job. He lost me, though. And I am the juror because I'm not a lawyer and I'm not that I'm in the middle of the road, I would say. And uh, and he had me lost during opening statements and in closing arguments. And he for sure lost the jurors in closings. Uh, Tim, you and I talked about that real quick. Allie giving us a super sticker here yeah. saying that uh, she feels for the Adelson kids having grown up with Don and Harvey. Um, unfortunately, that is a lottery in life. She got they got all got some bad parents there, it seems like. And uh, we're seeing the unfortunate result. Joel, I see you haven't found your keys 
<laughs> I'm gonna love this story. Not only have I not found my keys, I had to go to the office today to retrieve new ones. And I went up with their office assistant and we promptly got stuck in the elevator. I don't, I'm claustrophobic. That was not fun. I do have a key, but I was so traumatized from getting stuck in the elevator at my office that I decided to stay here in Studio 1K. Uh, thank you all for watching this. Please hit that like button. Um, thank you to Dave Arenberg, Florida State Attorney. Thank you to Jason, Jason Solomon, who is running justice for Dan Markell. Doesn't seem like justice for Dan Markell is uh, over yet. Tim Jansen, you're mm -hmm. on 2020 Friday night. How'd the interview go for that? It was good. Um, I did the uh, original interview a couple of months, a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month ago. And then they wanted me to come back and talk about the jury verdict, the closings. Um, so it, it's interesting. Um, I, you know, they say we got great stuff. I gave them some great sound bites because I know you give them a good sound bite, then they'll have you on. But they, they too believed and they agreed that the defense was not really believable. Um, I, I, don't, I don't disagree with, with, John, I, I, on the money rough up, but um, $100,000 to rough some up, that might be a problem. But I never, I thought his closing was very confusing. It was way long winded. He didn't take a break and he really was jumping around. He yeah. every, every like 15 minutes, he impeached Magbano again. Then yeah. he do his and go back. And, but the funniest thing was when he looked at the jurors and he had to know and he said, I'm almost done. <laughs> he was signal. The jury was signaling to them that they were done. Yeah, and he was signaling to them, "I'm almost done. I just got to read this. Please bear with me." Yeah, you know, you, you got to lose it when that happens. Terrible. You got to know when to wrap. So, Tim Jansen, who's next, if anyone, and who's after whoever is next? I would think, and I'm not the prosecutor, but I know Jack Campbell. He heard the evidence. I'm sure he was watching the whole trial. And I'm sure he's thinking, why haven't we charged Donna? Do we have enough to charge Harvey? Where are we on Wendy? And I think he's going to hit the snooze button on Wendy and maybe charge Donna and Harvey. See where they go. See what happens. You know, what's funny, Joel, too, is that, you know, on, on the one hand, you would think that the prosecution may have a little bit of Adelson fatigue because they've been living with this, Georgia specifically you know, for seven years um, since a probable cause affidavit and they've had three trials. But, you know, I, I've watched all three trials really carefully. And some of the witnesses that Georgia examined, she used the exact same direct examination outline, which is perfectly fine. Um, she just did it. The way it's freezing up and like the you just froze up right on that critical moment. Repeat that one more time, John. What, what I was saying was, is that that some of Georgia's examinations in this trial um, her direct of certain of the witnesses was the exact same as it was in the prior two trials. Some of her closing, which was brilliant, the way she talks to a jury, her, the way she has a great way about her, the way she can speak to a jury in layman's terms, and she can really connect with a jury. Um, some of her closing was just regurgitated from, from the prior cases. So a lot of the work has been done. We're not talking about any new work here for Donna. This is not going to be a monumental task for the prosecution. The case is done. It's already there. Yeah, we had um, Louis Baptiste on, who is a law student of Dan Markell, or he was on Court TV with me. I can't remember which. And he said they could try this case next week if they had to. Do you agree with that, John? A hundred percent. I mean, yeah. it's all it's all there for them. Charlie's was a little bit more complicated, obviously, um, than um the prior three, uh, the Magmanua, Rivera, and Garcia. This is the family now. But now that Charlie's done, I don't know about next week, but in very short order, she, they could try this case if they had to. And so, John Singer, since you're uh, moving forward here, what is your take? Is it Donna? Then is will we see Wendy in handcuffs? Donna, for sure. Um, I think there was some evidence adduced in this trial of which I had been previously unaware relating to Wendy. And again, I, th I thought I had known everything about the case, but there was certain evidence that just hadn't been presented. What, what stands out to you there? In Two things. Two things. One is that on Halloween, Charlie talked Wendy out of buying the house. Um, and on the same exact day is when he asked Katie 
if she had people who, if, if she had connections to people who could hurt somebody. And she said, yes. And I think Charlie went back to Wendy and said, don't buy the house. I will take care of this problem for you. Mm. And then there was that email or text from Wendy to Dan saying on January 14th to the 18th, you know, are you going to be in town? And can I have the kids one of those nights? So th there were just a few of those things that sort of buttressed Carl's 100 and however many points. Mm -hmm. um, I do think they have enough to indict Wendy. Conviction would be a, a bit more hard with her. I still think it's a it's it's a fifty one percent chance. I'll go back to what I've said already that they'll indict Wendy. It's bet it's it's a more probable than not that they will indict Wendy. But Donna's for sure is next, and that should be soon. When you say soon, are we talking next five days, two weeks, thirty hours? What are we I talking? think within the next ninety days. Wow, grand jury's got to meet. So exactly. Man, if I am Donna, I am chugging the Pepto. Shout out again to Black Widow for gifting another membership. Mary Griffin wants to know what ne network is 2020 on. Uh, it is on ABC News. Ain't going to have a show as good as this show, but you can watch it and support Tim Jansen. It's always a good thing. And look at this. Tim Jansen is so awesome. I have new respect for defense lawyers. Great Thank show you, Robin. Always. Thank you. Yeah, there you go. We're not all bad people. <laughs> Best guess for sure. Huge thanks goes out again to Florida State Attorney Dave Ehrenberg, Jason Solomon from Justice for Dan Markell, John Singer, a defense attorney out of New York City, and of course, famed Tallahassee defense attorney who will be on 2020 on ABC Friday night at 10 p.m. Eastern time. That is Tim Jansen tomorrow. Five nine o'clock. It's a nine two o'clock. Oh, maybe you're right. You're right. Two you're hour right. Yeah. Two hour, nine o'clock. Thank you for the correction. 9 p.m. Eastern time. And tomorrow, we've got the former Latin King leader of the New York City chapter talking about what life will be like behind bars with or for Charlie Adelson. And joining him will be Larry Levine, who's a character, along with Tommy Scoville uh, of YouTube fame, K9 Catherine from Maui, always coming in big with uh, the five memberships here. And I'm multitasking. Thank you to one and all. Love you, America. Love you, my home, New Jersey, New York City, Tallahassee, and a special shout out to the Markel family. Love you as well. Till tomorrow, 5 p.m. Eastern time. <laughs>